Hello, my name is Pastor Freddy Reynosa, and I am the senior pastor at the Stoner Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church on Nobility Hill in Stoner, Massachusetts. Our church has been serving the greater Boston area for over a hundred years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonamemorial.org, or visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you for joining us here at our weekly church service. It's really good to see you all. Happy Sabbath, a pleasant good morning. And uh, it is my privilege this morning to extend you a warm welcome, not only to the church members, but uh, those who are watching from home on YouTube, as well, welcome. Again, welcome. We're happy that you're here, and it is my hope that uh, you find the blessing that you came for today. So I'm going to read you a story. Crack. An odd noise woke up little Amy late at night. Lifting her head, she smelled a foul odor in the air. In another bedroom of the house, the noise woke up father and mother, and they smelled the foul odor. Amy's brother also woke up and sniffed the air. 
but no one wanted to come out of their room to see what was happening. Burglars often broke into homes in their village, and they did not want to be attacked. Finally, Amy's curiosity got the better of her, and she decided to take a look. Peeking out of the door, she saw that the television was engulfed in a ball of fire. The television set was in a wooden cabinet in the living room. On top of the cabinet was a big flower vase. Now everything seemed to be surrounded by a big hot fire. Orange flames were looking at the ceiling. The fire was quickly spreading toward the kitchen and garage. Amy screamed for someone to come and help her. But the fire was so hot that no one dared come out of their rooms. Her father, mother, and brother quickly ran to a window at the back of the house and jumped out. But Amy did not run. She fell on her knees. God, please save us, she prayed. At that moment, the big flower vase fell over on the wooden cabinet and into the fire. Suddenly, the flames stopped. The fire immediately died out. Several neighbors had seen the fire and were trying to help. They ran to the front of the house and pounded on the closed wooden windows, trying to break them in order to enter. No matter how hard they hit, the closed windows would not break. Then they saw that the fire had gone out. It was a good thing that the windows did not break because it would have cost a lot of money to replace them. Why didn't the fire go out? Why did the fire go out? Why didn't the, the window break? Those were the only strange those weren't the only strange things that happened. Mother and the children were Christians and loved the God of heaven, but father did not know God. He allowed mother and the children to go to church on Sabbath, but he wasn't interested in going with them. Like many of, of the people, he had wooden images of his dead great-great-grandfathers and great-great-grandmothers in a corner of his house, and he honored them. Strangely, the fire did not destroy anything in the house except the wooden images of his dead great-great-grandfathers and great-great-grandmothers. The wooden images were burned to ashes. Amy's family repainted the living room after the fire, and they dedicated their home to God. They realized, like never before, that their home and everything they owned actually belongs to God. Father gladly joined mother and the children in the prayer of dedication for the house. He saw that the God who had answered Amy's prayer was more powerful than all of his wooden images. Someone want to pray? No? Okay, I'll pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us all to church today. Please be with us today and help us to learn from the story and from the sermon and to remember that everything we have belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you all. Um, thank you for that story, uh, Sarah. Everything belongs to God. We are all stewards over what God has placed in our hands. And um, the um, offering today is for a combined budget, our local combined budget. And uh, that doesn't sound very glamorous, the combined budget, but you know, lights, heat. Um, we know utilities are going up as is everything else. Um, if you've been to the gas station lately, it brought back memories back in, most of you were around the 70s, but I remember waiting up on Maple Street here down to get to the mobile, odd even, I think whatever your plate number was, odd even waiting in line, so. 
Um, so, we, you know, we live in some very strange times, don't we? But, uh, <clears throat> but it's our role as stewards to take care of God's house. Um, as I mentioned, some of those things. Um, but also evangelism, our children's divisions, uh, supplies and, and different things like that that we, uh, that we need each month. And uh, your budget's probably been strained by some of the aforementioned things that are going on with prices and, and such. But, but interesting enough though, that we've been through what, two years of a pandemic and now there's a, a war going on in Ukraine and, and uh, it just seems like we get out of one thing and then something else comes along. Constant reminders, it's not our home. But uh, interesting, during this two years, God has, has blessed in spite of it. I mean, we weren't meeting for a while, but if you ask Dennis, um, God has blessed tremendously even in spite of what the situation looked like. And uh, reminded of a quote from Stewart's uh, Ministry of Healing, uh, page four, 481. It says, our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. And I think thousand ways is, might be too small. I think God has a billion ways. And, uh, and uh, we want to... Uh, <clears throat> Be faithful, we know, I, I got an email from uh, ADRA. ADRA is uh, looking for, for financial donations to help people of Ukraine and uh, refugees and all that that's it's going on there. And uh, so um, you can do that through your uh, tithe envelope. And uh, if you have your uh, tithe envelopes, with, envelopes with you, you can put them in the boxes at the back and at the side of the church. Uh, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we, we know that you have a thousand ways and beyond, that uh, everything that we have is yours. You put us in position to, uh, to, be, good, to be stewards, to be faithful stewards. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that we can honor you and worship you by the way that we give and by the way that we see ourselves as stewards of everything you've given us. We, we pray that the monies that are collected, your tithes in our offerings will be just multiplied, Lord, and that we can be a blessing to those that are in need and uh, that we can certainly honor Jesus, our wonderful Savior. Thank you for all that you do for us, every blessing, Lord, that we have, we give, we give thanks and, and praise to you, and we, we pray that you will continue to worship with us now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is relieved. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down and take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'd like to ask those of you who can to please kneel with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us. And Father, like that 
worship song said, take it to the Lord in prayer. That's what we're doing now, Father. So we come to you, Father, to not only give you thanks for this week, but to thank you, Father, for everything that you're doing in our lives. And Father, we come to you asking for forgiveness, Father, for our sins, ones that we don't even know that we committed, but we just ask you, Father, that, that you help us, Father. Father, we ask for, for you to be with the people in Ukraine, everyone who is involved in, in this war. Father, we just ask you to be there. We don't understand what's happening, but we know that you are with everyone, Father. And we just ask, Father, that you also cancel the, the enemy, what he is doing. And we ask, Father, that you be with all the people who are there who are calling upon you, Father, even those who do not know you, who have called you for the first time, we ask, Father, that you, that you keep on opening their hearts and that you touch them. Father, we ask for our children also who are in school, that you can build them up with your spirit, Father. We thank you for everything that you do in their lives, and we ask that you can also help each one of us, their parents, grandparents, whoever it is, Father, that you can help us have the character of Christ so that they can see you in us, Father. Father, we ask for the people also who are um, by way of social media who can hear us and who, who watch us, who are committed and who are there and who also wish to be here but are at home. And we, we thank you, Father, for them who are, like we said, committed to this church. We ask all this, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hello. Happy Sabbath, church. Good morning. Um, I'm so honored to be here to share this song with you. Um, the lyrics of the song remind us that all creation sings one single song of hallelujah to the Lord. And when we think of how God has created us, how he made us, and how he saved us, all souls should also um, join in with creation and sing hallelujah and praise to him. I hope this song blesses you. No stop. 
stars in the sky, no wave of the ocean and sea. Who does not sing out of the way and the truth and the life that has set the song free? So sing from your heart, we're hidden with the real life. Sing from the life that He gave. Sing from the mind He has filled with His own. Sing from the soul He has saved. Hallelujah. the best praise that, that, that one could get from the mouth of a child. And indeed, yes, hallelujah. It's, it's a very powerful song. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and happy Sabbath. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here. I'm thankful for the opportunity. I feel humbled by it. And uh, I, I, I'd like to take a few minutes today for us to meditate a little bit on the second shortest verse in the Bible. I'm sure you know, you are familiar with the first short, with the shortest verse of the Bible. Jesus wept. Well, this one has one extra word. Remember Lot's wife. Three words and a reference to a yet unnamed woman, a woman that we don't know her name, yet Jesus thought it is so important for us to remember about her that he stated that expressly, remember Lot's wife. I think it's up to us to fill in the blanks. Remember Chris, remember Peter. I hope not in that context, but that's the, that, that is the, the purpose that, uh, that we don't know the name so we can very easily identify, and we'll see where that leads us. Who was Lot's wife? And how do, you get, how, how do we get to know about her? The story begins in Genesis a few chapters before. 
in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a, la a land that I will show thee. Abraham happened to be a very wealthy city dweller. He was a citizen of Ur in Chaldea, which is, by all accounts, probably the most culturally and uh, technologically, if you will, advanced city of the age, of that age. Uh, in Ur, you probably remember, there were those ziggurats, those, those temples, those uh, trapezoid, paralepidic temples that uh, uh, were built in honor of uh, pagan deities. Uh, there was a, a current water, there was a market, uh, people knew a lot of things that uh, we enjoy today. So by all accounts, it was one of the most advanced places on the face of the earth. And God is telling, is asking this group of people under the promise that he will give them a land to live what they have behind. And you, the, the, the theme of, of today's meditation will be leave behind, leave thee behind. God is asking for the first time, Abraham and his family, leave your life, uh, your life the way you know it behind and become, instead of a city dweller, a tent dweller. Become a peregrine, become a, 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 an immigrant in this world and never set set roots anywhere because the, the, the country that you are looking for and the city they are looking for is much better than the one you have now because the foundations have been laid by God. So what is Abraham doing? Calling his psychiatrist, I heard a voice telling me something unbelievable. Goes in therapy to understand from where are, the, are those impulses coming. He, he believes God, strangely, strangely for the world that he is living in. He believes God and, 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 and does exactly as he was told. Not only him, in verse 4, Abraham departed and as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, if he was 75 and he had Isaac when he was 100, we may say that he was probably in his prime. Lot was uh, his nephew, the, the, uh, the son of his uh, brother who died, and Abraham took him with, uh, uh, with him in this small group uh, looking for the promised land. Probably there were there, there, there would have been at least 40, 50 years age difference between Abraham and Lot. And they, they travel, and soon enough, there is trouble within this little group. In, in chapter 13, we hear in verse 7, and there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and Perizzites dwelled then in the land. I'm, I'm amazed every time when reading the Bible, there is not a single word missing or a single extra word. Every word is important in the Bible. As, as, as the same as the absence, as we were talking about the name of Lot's wife. But here, uh, there is strife. The strife is not, uh, it starts with uh, the herdmen, but it reflects the, the conflict at the top. Lot is not getting along well with his uncle. And, and, and uh, the herdsmen get word of this, and they start arguing themselves. 
And the Bible says that the Canaanites and Perizzites dwelt then in the land. It's not just an historical stand, statement. It shows that there were witnesses from the hidden people, and they, they were looking at this group of people who professed to, to follow God's call, and, and, and they were fight, there were fights amongst themselves. Not a good uh, 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 situation to, to show the others. So Abram is calling Lot, and uh, they decide to split. Um, in verse 10, Lot uh, uh, has the first choice. I wonder if Lot chose the other way around, but he has the first choice. And uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, verse 10, he's lifted up his eyes, beheld all the plain of Jordan, that is all watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. So this is a land of unparalleled beauty and, uh, and uh, uh, wealth and resources. It's compared to the Garden of Eden and to Egypt because Egypt, due to the Nile uh, uh, Delta, was always fertile and the people used to go to Egypt many times during famines. Abraham did so, uh, uh, Jacob and other of the um, uh, from, from the uh, Israelites. So Lot sees something that looks great. It's a great opportunity. Uh, I will take this and uh, Abram will be left with the uh, mountainous and uh, with, with the uh, rest of the Canaan. And uh, uh, we learn that Lot pitched his tent toward Sodoma. That's an interesting statement because they knew uh, what Sodoma was. It was, after all, one, uh, a, a very developed city, very wealthy, and um, um, there were plenty of opportunities. There, there must have been good schools, good hospitals, uh, good universities, opportunities for commerce, for banking, for business, Lot must have thought I can sell uh, some of the, the animals that I have in exchange for, for uh, other goods. Uh, my retirement is taken care of. So he ends up in uh, becoming a city dweller. Now I, I may go out on a limb if I will tell you that I believe that God's plan was not for people to live in cities. Uh, what were uh, Adam and Eve told after creation? Go uh, uh, and multiply and fill the earth. Um, what happened with uh, Cain after he killed his brother, after the first murder? He went from the face of the Lord and built a City, interesting. Why, why, why would that be the case? Why, 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 why God does not necessarily want his people to live in, in cities? Because they attract all kind of, of opportunities, but also all kind of problems. Crime, um, so, some of the choices that people of Sodoma and Gomorrah were, 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 were doing and so on and so forth. So it may well come the time when we'll hear again the call, live. The cities will, will become difficult to, to navigate and to inhabit. You, 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 up until last week, I thought this sounds strange. And all of a sudden we hear about this happening, people leaving their, their homes behind because of evil. Evil, evil cannot be explained or understood, but when, when, when the uh, enemy is allowed to hit, he makes no mistake, no mistakes. So that wasn't the case when Lot pitched his tent towards Sodoma. He ended up getting into close, uh, close business with uh, uh, the dwellers of the city 
and uh, apparently moved slowly, but surely he was attracted by the city, moved into the city, and made his dwelling inside the wall. Now, that's an interesting place to be. Uh, uh, walls of the cities did not used to be like today, but there were places where uh, business took place, uh, people coming and entering the city, as well as uh, uh, seats for judgment. And from all what we know, there is a suggestion that Lot was even appointed as a judge uh, in, in uh, Sodoma uh, due to his uh, relationship with Abraham and also due to his um, standing and to his ethics. Genesis um, 19 brings us to the episode that we want to, to look at. Verse 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Who are those two angels? One chapter before, Abraham, who was living about 25 miles uh, to, to the south, receives a visit as well from three. Uh, uh, I, 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 have, I, I don't know how to call them, if you call them people. Let, let's say three uh, guests. And one happens to be God, God, the one whom we are singing alleluia and uh, who be we believe his presence is here, has actually interacted with humans in person along the history. So God comes to Abraham accompanied by, by two angels. And uh, uh, in biblical times, we are within one year of the birth of Isaac. For Abraham, this is the sixth time that the God appears to him in person and is telling him, that next year when I come, you will have your son, at which Sarah, Sarah, uh, uh, who hears this, uh, starts laughing. Uh, and uh, God is making known his intention to Abraham that he's come not only to, to uh, uh, ensure, to assure him of the birth of his own son, but also to let him know what his plans were with uh, uh, Sodoma, Gomorrah, and there were five cities of the plain. God is telling Abraham about that, and Abraham starts a, a very interesting negotiation, bargaining. Uh, he is uh, uh, thinking, obviously, of his uh, nephew, and he's trying to save his life. He he's, he is arguing with God about the number of people, of right people, righteous people, so to speak, that will be the limit uh, at which God will consider not destroying the city. So they start, that, think of it, that might have been a, a city of at least hundreds of thousands of inhabitants. And they start the bidding from 50. Probably Abraham uh, made some, some mental calculations of Lot, must, Lot, his wife, his family. Uh, overall, let's start with 50. And uh, emboldened by, by God's grace, he goes first, what if there are 45? Will you still destroy the city? God says no. And Abraham, in his humbleness, is asking, I, 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 I'm opening my mouth again, and I, I, I want to ask, what if there are 40? And then from 40, it goes down in 10. 40, 30, 20, and they end up with 10. God promises him that he will not destroy the city if there are found 10 people, 10 righteous people. Probably Abraham feels better now. He thinks, you know, with all this, we're going to make up this number, and who knows after all, we think about God destroying Sodoma and Gomorrah. Well, preparing for this, I was stricken by the fact that first God saved them. 
If we go in, in, in Genesis, I think it's chapter 15. I'm sorry, 14. There's a battle, and uh, the kings uh, of Elam and other nations uh, wage war against Sodoma, Gomorrah, and the other cities, uh, take them over and take their inhabitants into slavery. That, that happened probably a few years before the final destruction. And who intervenes here? City dwellers, after all, did not seem to be great fighters. There was not, no guerrilla w warfare. They, they just gave up and uh, they, they were taken prisoners. So what armies of scores and scores of people could not do, uh, Abraham does with how many people? The Bible tells us 318. It takes 318 of his people that he himself had trained. They go at night and under the cover of darkness, they attack, they strike the enemy, and they free up the, not only Lot, but also the inhabitants of Sodoma and Gomorrah. So this is one instance when they have been saved by Abraham, therefore by God, and allowed to have another opportunity or opportunities to change their, their lives. So with, with this uh, occasion, probably, um, since Abraham refused any, um, uh, uh, any payment, so to speak, from, from uh, uh, those cities, uh, uh, in, in sign of uh, respect, as a sign of respect, probably Lot was appointed a judge in the city. Lot being his nephew. So the angels show up this time uh, at the gate and uh, Lot is maybe one of the reasons for him to be there was just to welcome visitors. Uh, during the ancient times, the industry of hospitality was, uh, was not existing. So to travel from one place to another, one either had to sleep outside or to depend on the hospitality of unknown people that would invite them under their roof. And that's precisely what both Abraham and uh, Lot have done. He saw them, Lot, in verse 1, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. He did not know who they are. He finds out later, but the, the uh, oriental custom is to bow yourself in front of your, of your guest. They become your guests, and uh, uh, you are not only to provide for their needs, but also to defend them from any, any kind of threat. And in verse 2, Lot said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all, all night. And again, words in the scripture that are always there for a reason. Listen to what he tells them. Wash your feet, so you, uh, uh, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. So washing the feet. And then in verse 3, he made them a feast and did bake what? Unleavened bread. What is washing of the feet and eating unleavened bread? It's the Lord's Supper. Before being saved, before his life being saved, without him knowing, Lot partakes in the Lord's Supper. Isn't that amazing? And, and, and the, the, the Lord had shown up in person a little later. We'll, we'll see that. So as they, were, as they were partaking, word is out. People of Sodoma gathered. And uh, the Bible says in verse 4, 
that were all the people from every quarter. Doesn't mean the whole population of the city, but there was representation, so to speak. People from all walks of life, from all classes were there. And uh, uh, without going into details, I'll just say that they were not there to ask for the guests to come out to give autographs or to shake their hands. Lot kicks into high gear. He knows that he has the duty to protect the lives of, those, of his guests. And uh, he is arguing with the mob. He's trying to, to, uh, bring some, to talk some sense into them. It, it seems to be beyond that. And before moving forward, I wanted to emphasize one thing. God sent the two angels. God could have done what was accomplished without any presence there. He did not need. This is a, a, a preview, if you will, of the judgment. God is sending two angels to investigate. He knew, but he is sending two angels to investigate the sins of the city, to report them. It's more for our benefit and for everybody who reads about this, as well as for Lot and his family. And not only that, during this, the angels are given the, the people the, of Sodoma another chance to repent and stop from what they were planning to do. He is, uh, the, um, Lot is arguing with them and not being successful, he resorts to the last possibility. Now to understand this, I think you have to have an Eastern mind or, or to be familiar with the culture, with the Eastern culture, because what he does is very hard to comprehend. He's offering his two daughters to, to the mob in order to, to save the life of his guests. It seems barbarian, but once again, it is uh, uh, for, for the people in the Eastern culture, hospitality was beyond any sacrifice. At, some, at, at that point, the mob is threatening him. They, uh, they are emphasizing the fact that you are a foreigner, you've been judging us, but we have had it, and we are going to treat you worse and do you worse than what we are going to do to those two people. So take them out to us. At, at which point the angels reveal their nature. That must have been a scene to behold. They, uh, they open the door, they, they, they bring Lot inside, and then all of a sudden, the mob is hurt, is, is stricken with blindness. This blindness is only described another time, this kind of blindness is only described another time in the Bible, in, in uh, Second Kings, I believe, where Elisha is asking from God the same, and the, uh, the, uh, the army uh, that was going to conquer the city is stricken with blindness, which seemed to have been not total blindness, some, some sort of decreased ability to see combined with confusion. And uh, he is uh, leading them where? In the main square, when, when they open their eyes, he's asking the God to open their eyes, they see themselves surrounded by the uh, Israelites' army. So the same thing happens to the, to the mob, because instead, if they were totally blind, they would have stopped. But even in their uh, affected state, they were still uh, trying to fight and, and find the door and uh, get, get access to, to, to Lot's house. It didn't happen, but once again, it was another missed opportunity, unfortunately, um, for them. The angels now reveal the, their plan. They, they, they tell Lot what is going to happen, and they are asking him in remembrance of the promise that God has made to Abraham, 
in verse 12. Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord had sent us to destroy it. So Lot understands who they are, why are they there, and that there is a limited time. And that night, he spends going for, uh, uh, after his family. Presumably, he had more children than the two daughters. He had uh, uh, sons-in-law. There was a big family. And they have become so accustomed with living in the city that when Lot shows up in the middle of the night asking them to leave because the city will be destroyed, what do you think they happen? I guess in today's parlance, uh, it would be they accuse him of spreading misinformation. They cut his account. His, his Twitter is being erased. He cannot go around telling people living in that wonderful and strong city that they are going to perish that same day. So they, they make fun of him. It's a, it's a common theme to what happened to Noah. Uh, during the time he preached and, and, and told people the, the world will come to an end. The, it fell on deaf ears by people's own, own, own choice. So the night is, is passing and uh, Lot is unsuccessful. He comes back and uh, is in the morning, verse 15. When the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Now it's Lot's turn. He's tried to, to, to convince the rest of his family. Now it's his immediate family, Lot, his wife, his two daughters. We, we, one would think they quickly arose and ran out of the city. Really, is that what, what the Bible tells us? Verse 16, while he lingered, it was too much to leave behind. In fact, it was all his life. From the, that day when he saw the, the, the plain and the cities and he made the choice, he became a very wealthy man. It was very difficult to leave everything. After all, when God told them for the first time, come out of Ur, of Haran, they left without, without a problem. This time, Lot had roots. It, he felt it's difficult. That brings to us the, the, the idea of the last times. We busy ourselves with almost everything. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we have to set our priorities because time will come. If I heard the voice, Chris, get out of your house now, what will I first take with me? Thank you, Nicole, in the first place. Phil, yes. But then they will say, wait, well, what's wrong with you? Uh, there's nothing happening. The, the sky is, is there, there's no uh, storm. Why, why, why are you in such a hurry? Let's take a few things that we think we will need. Well, what do we come with in this world? In the ancient times, they had this custom where, where when a child was born, they brought uh, an array of, of objects with different meanings and they, they had the, the, the child touch some, some of them, and they thought that was a way of predicting the future. I think some of the Greek, uh, 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 Greeks were, were, were doing that a lot, and they, they were predicting about Alexander the Great. I, I forgot what he, what he touched, probably gold. When, uh, but Alexander the Great, who died in his 30s, uh, uh, apparently asked to be buried with his hands out. 
just to show to posterity what he took with him from this world. With that said, it is very difficult to leave things behind. And uh, uh, we should not be so quick to judge Lot, but his hesitation actually contributed to the tragedy that happened after that. This time, Lot not only that uh, is uh, taking his time, probably he even asked the angels, can you give me more time? I can convince my family. I'm sure I will convince half of the city to come out only if, if you gave me more time. Unfortunately, we, they were at the point where even if given more time, all what that would have done would have been to further delay Lot, who might have ended up saying, I'm not leaving. But uh, there's, there's, no, there's no more time. And they, they are telling him, go to the mountains and save yourself. And the poor city dweller, Lot, is doing what? He's asking, let me go to a smaller city. I, uh, uh, that brings to mind the words of the Savior after, he, uh, after uh, they bring to him the woman who was found sinning. He's uh, shaming the, the accusers. And then he's telling her, go and sin no more. There's no uh, anything like go and sin less. Uh, or or uh, uh, same thing like Lot is asking here, let me go to a smaller city. Maybe things will be different there. And amazingly enough, God is allowing this. And I'm saying God because this time, uh, the, the biblical report uses the word he. It's a he. It's not the two angels. It's somebody else. It's God himself who has appeared and who is allowing Lot to run to the nearest city and save his life. There is still negotiation going on when the, when the sun is rising. When, when the, the, what was going to be the last day of that city is beginning, Lot is still bargaining with God and with the angels. So since there was no, no time left. The two angels take Lot. They use all their hands. One angel takes Lot and his wife. The other, his two daughters. And they drag them out of the city. We have a, a work to accomplish here. You do as you are told. Say, run, save your life, but do not look back. And here we get into something, some interesting territory. What's wrong with looking back? Because apparently, uh, to her misfortune, Miss Lot found out what the problem was, was, was with looking back. In looking back, I think we describe what it's becoming known as nostalgia. Nostalgia is, is, a, is an interesting feeling as, as the word is made of two other words, nostos, which means home in Greek, and algia, which means pain. People feel homesick. And uh, interestingly enough, for the first time, the term was uh, described by a Swiss medical student in the 1600s, where uh, he was trying to explain a, a, a strange illness that struck the, the Swiss army while, while they are doing a siege of a, of a city in, in a war. They were, uh, they were uh, becoming sad, they were stopping eating, and some of them were dying within a few weeks from the onset. So uh, it, the first time when it was described, it was like almost something physical. But it's not only that. It's, uh, if you will, the wish for the place that never was, or the home. Because we, we live now and we think back, oh, things were so different back then, in an idealizing way. 
that the world that we, we are longing for never existed. If you doubt that, there is an episode in the Bible where the Israelites, after being taken out of Egypt, start suffering of acute nostalgia. Uh, oh, Moses, you took us here to kill us. At least in Egypt, we had what? We had food for totally forgetting that they did not have enough food in Egypt. It wasn't a certainty, and it came with the price of slavery. But for them, it was reason enough to start a, 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 a movement and the strife that, uh, and, and trying to stone Moses, to stone him to death. And that day, having quite a few of them killed because of, of this sin. So this is what nostalgia does, idealizing the past. Uh, we, we, we become stuck in a present that is not ours either. And uh, we'll see that maybe in a way that's what happened to, to Lot's wife. They are leaving the city they are moving for a while. And as the custom in the Orient was, the, 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 the husband goes first. It must have been a, a, a little convoy. The a lot coming first, his uh, daughters, and the wife. And the wife starts sliding back. And uh, she looks back to see the place that she started missing. She started probably missing the life there, missing her children who were actually perishing in, in, in that fire. And probably she did not want to go any further. You see, the angels took four people out of Sodoma. They took Lot, his daughters, and the wife. This is, they gave him the opportunity to be saved they could not save anybody against their will. This is, <clears throat> this is something that we have to keep in mind. She decided that she does not want. If God saved her, it would have been the same like allowing sin to enter the world renewed by, by, by God on the new earth. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to argue with myself and uh, get to the conclusion that no sin and uh, uh, not even any thought. After all, we have to be certain that we want to be in heaven. Do we want to become, to, to live behind what we think we have? Think of it. Do you like to live out in the country? maybe uh, and although we cannot imagine heaven and, and there will be so much to do and, 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 and to interact and, and, and to think if we love more what we have here we better say that way there's no there, there's no problem everybody will be allowed to make a choice for us we have a life we had a life for the uh, people of Sodoma and Gomorrah, it was a split moment, yes or no, come out now or not. But at any rate, every single human being will need to make a choice. Um, and uh, Lot made a choice. Apparently, the daughters made the choice as well. Uh, his wife looked back, and uh, interestingly enough, she did not... She could have died, she could have vaporized, she, she, she could have disappeared. She turned into a pillar of salt. And we may wonder why salt and not pepper <laughs> for that, for that matter, matter. Well, again, there, there are things in the Bible that uh, are always for a reason. In the first place, it seems that when Jesus used 
the, the, um, Lot, uh, the example of Lot's wife, he did it for a purpose. As it was his custom, he would re uh, make reference to things that people would have known. So uh, uh, during Jesus' time, there are testimonies for, from at least three historians, one of them being Josephus, that Lot's wife, uh, the, the formation, the salt uh, uh, for, uh, for rock formation was visible and people knew who, uh, who Jesus was mentioning. So when he says, remember Lot's wife, is not something just in theory or use your imagination. Some of his uh, listeners would have seen what was thought to be uh, Lot's wife. Uh, there are some of those rocks uh, uh, apparently still today on the shore, on the south shore of the uh, Dead Sea. Uh, they are not probably, the, the real one was covered by waters, but for a little while it was around and the people could have seen it and, and this way relate, relate to it. Um, but uh, Josephus has a paragraph in the Antiquities of the Jews where he describes that briefly. But Lot's wife continually turning back to view the city as she went from it and being too nicely inquisitive what would become of it, or the God who had forbidden her to do so was changed into a pillar of salt for I have seen it and remains to this day. So there, there is at least one, one historical re, uh, uh, report of that. Salt is mentioned many times in the Bible. It, used to, uh, uh, it was used not only uh, to seasoned food, but also uh, uh, for trade. Uh, the, the young born, uh, uh, born uh, babies in Israel used to be rubbed with salt as a cleaning. Uh, it was used to preserve things. And uh, uh, Jesus makes a point that if the salt loses its quality, it, it has to be discarded. Uh, probably it was, uh, at a certain time in history, it, it was worth more than its weight in gold. Um, Mrs. Lot, unfortunately, becomes uh, a salt pillar in order to illustrate the fact that the land covered by salt, which is what became of that area, is barren and there is no life that, that could happen in that place again. So she, if you will, she became the first marker. Do not enter, there is no life here. Uh, at least that's probably one, one of the uh, reasons for her to turn into a pillar of salt. There are instances in the Bible where Jesus uh, and, and the disciples talk about backsliding. And um, there is an episode where Jesus sent 70 disciples to go and preach. And uh, they looked back and uh, none went uh, into preaching as asked by the master. Uh, there was um, one of the 12 apostles, uh, uh, disciples, Judah. He turned back from Jesus and uh, uh, lived a few more hours before taking his own life. A very dramatic uh, scene of, uh, of uh, the uh, passion of Christ. Ecclesiastes 17, do not say why were the old days better than these, for it is not wise to ask such questions. 
2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. No need to look into the past. No need to desire things from the past. Everything is new. God will make a, a new earth and will give us a new mind and uh, all the, the, the things are passed away. Isaiah 43, 18, 21. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. And uh, Philippians 3, 13, 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have a hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And lastly, in Jesus' own words, Jesus replied, Luke 9, 62, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. There are strong words, but luckily for us, we have the example of those past generations. There's a very dramatic and impressionant episodes of the past. We have the choice. The angels can only do that much. They will drag us out but we have to stay there and to keep moving forward. Looking back is not good for one's health. Thank you, amen. The last, the last hymnal is number 626. In a little while, we are going home. Interestingly enough, 214 is another message of hope, is we have this hope. Uh, but we will be singing 626. Let's rise and sing.
Let us pray. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for watching our program today. If you have any questions, please call us at 781-438-2977. Again, that is 781-438-2977. We hope to see you soon in person here at our church on Saturdays for our 1045 a.m. worship service or for Monday night prayer time at 7 p.m. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.